is a lecture on translation technologies, not so much on what they are at the moment and what you can do with them, but I'm more interested in where they're going historically and what effects they have on translation as a mode of communication. If we look at the history of technologies, of communication technologies, uh, we could more or less agree on this kind of sequence. Uh, for most of humanity, we used voice. And voice requires some minimal presence, depending on how well you can shout over distance. Uh, but people in the, the age of voice communication required mutual presence for communication, and that affected the kinds of communities they had, the size of the communities, uh, and how they interrelated. Uh, one of the readings of the interpreter in Latin, interpres, uh, is uh, uh, that person who is between the, uh, the negotiating parties. Uh, another reading is this interprice, of course, that the person is there to negotiate the price of what's being bought or sold. Either way, presence is assumed and is still, well, until recently, was assumed as one of the defining features of interpreting as opposed to written translation. We then have a long sequence of writing, of thereby uh, the development of, of writing systems. You could write on stone, on bone, on papyrus, on parchment. These are all fairly expensive media, expensive to get. The parchment is, is hides of animals and, uh, and heavy to transport. Uh, and difficult papyrus is okay, it's, it's fairly light, but you would have it rolled up and it, it's rather difficult uh, to manipulate. Something of a revolution in uh, written translation came with the movement to paper. And I'll try to explain why. Um, for example, um, if I'm looking at the uh, translators in Hispania, Spain didn't exist in the 12th and 13th century, there's evidence that they were speaking, a group of people were speaking, they were got an Arabic text, they would discuss what it means, they would be a Latinist, usually a Jew who knew Arabic, there's some traces of Moss Arab presence, and in what's written down, in parchment, uh, you have the traces of orality. Uh, this means that the thinking process, the selection process, was worked out orally and then the definitive translation was written down because it was hard to correct and expensive to correct. When paper comes in, uh, the Christians conquered Shativa in the 13th century and then they got the, paper, the technology for making paper, which the Chinese had developed in the 2nd and 3rd centuries. Uh, when paper came in, this was marginally cheaper. So there's evidence there in the 13th century of more retranslations. They would do one translation and then correct it with the retranslation coming on later. And then the definitive corrected translation would be written on parchment and presented to the client, the king or, or nobility, while the imperfect copies, the drafts, if you like, had a certain circulation among the nobility and lesser nobility. So paper really enabled a process of written revision, uh, such as we know it today, and a certain circulation of imperfect versions of uh, translations. People in that age, uh, getting a translation, would be very aware that it could have been otherwise, that the translation was a proposal and that there were other translations, which were different, in circulation. So one didn't expect the same text to say the same thing in all, all translations. Uh, for that very reason, you also find, particularly in the 12th century, uh, the text proper, and then lots of notes in the margin or underneath on the variants, on the other ways in which the translation could be, or possible interpretations of the text. Uh, so in a sense that orality, that oral discussion, was written into the translation as a text. 
All that changed, however, with uh, the advent of printing. And it's instructive to think about what that means. With printing, you have more or less the same text being reproduced, and it is the same. Uh, you don't get a text and think, oh, this is one version of, of many other things. Um, think of a joke. You, you, you hear a joke, you note the way it's told, but you know this joke has been circulating, and it could be told in a thousand other ways and still be the same joke. Suddenly with printing, ah, that's your joke, those are exactly the words, that's exactly what you have to translate. And that exact form of the text will be available later for anyone who wants to check it and uh, criticize your translation. So printing, uh, I hypothesized, uh, brought about a stable start text, uh, and thereby something you could be faithful to, and... They didn't use the term equivalence, but a regime of a certain accuracy came into play. Uh, it's the age of print, where the figure, the voice of the author becomes important, and translators also assume individual voices. Uh, the text now embodies the voice of an author, and translators are theorizing in interpersonal terms, whereas before, they would be talking about the text as a thing that they're trying to interpret. Uh, this is the age of, of Renaissance humanist translation theory uh, and the beginnings of what we know as equivalence theory. Prior to print, people worked as teams as well. It was not assumed in the Middle Ages that there would be one translator. It would be the translator who knows Latin, working with the field expert, working with the informant who knows Arabic, uh, for example. And there are many traces of that kind of teamwork. When you get into print, you have a text, uh, usually in, in, in a European vernacular language, and uh, the one person gets to work on it. So you get Etienne Dolé, and he's uh, rules for translators, and the first thing he says is that the translator has to know the two language, languages perfectly. That was not assumed prior uh, to print, and it's not by accident, I suggest, that Etienne Dolé was indeed a printer. The age of print then changes translation as distribution grows, and you get mass distribution with the steam press in the 19th century, and modernity spreading over the globe, uh, which definitively breaks any illusion of presence of a shared context uh, as a prerequisite for translation. Uh, strange books arrive in China and Japan, and strange items, printed items, arrive and are going the other way as well. And uh, this uh, technifies the process of, of translation uh, on the one hand, you have theories that uh, require you to engage with the voice of the text as a person, but then technologies that are separating you definitively from that context of text production. That moves even further in our age of electronic communication. Uh, what's interesting, though, in electronic communication, as opposed to the age of print, is that every text we work on could be otherwise. Think of the software program that we're localizing at the moment, but it's a version of the previous one, which is, you know, it's word point eight, or our operating system is eight, but there was a one back there, and in two years' time we'll have further improvements and, and uh, updates of that particular text. So there's a transitory uh, nature of the translational task, there's no longer the need to be faithful to that particular bit of language that is there, because it could be otherwise, it could be improved the next time round. And we get the advent of translation as a fragmented task. Uh, in many cases where a piece of software uh, comes out in a new version, translators are only given the new bits, and they have to translate those new bits as isolated fragments of text, often without seeing the entire context. Well, software programs are huge. You don't really want to see the entire context. 
The same can be said, of course, for large documentation processes and, and websites as well. Uh, these are new areas where the technology has obviously brought in new modes of translation, new relations between the translator and the other communication participants, most of whom are not seen. Uh, it's for that kind of reason, as a direct consequence of the technologies, I think, that we've got new terms like localization, which means translation plus a lot of technology and a few other things. I want to consider one hypothesis now. The slide's not very good, but anyway, you'll get the idea. Uh, that this process of uh, increasing technology breaks the linearity of the text. And what do I mean by linearity? I mean, you start at one end, go to the middle, and go to the end, as Aristotle said of a piece of drama or a piece of tragedy. There's a beginning, a middle, and the end, and you receive that in that order, uh, like telling a story. Uh, if you think about it, uh, that linearity belongs to spoken communication because you tell a story and you can only say one thing at a time. When you get a written text, though, the reader is able to jump from one side to the other and do many different things. Uh, you get a written Bible, uh, you no longer read it from beginning to end, you jump between various chapters and construct your message uh, on the various fragments you pick up, and you get a non-linear reading process. And in fact, if you look at the Bible and the way it was composed, there's a non-linear production process as well. Now, technologies, I suggest, generally break up that linearity. Here you've got what a corpus does to a text. We've got the term select, and we've imposed a paradigmatic, a, a vertical operation on the otherwise linear or horizontal flow of text. And technology enables us to do that and to compare all the different ways in which that word select is used. You can do that with the translation, of course. You can decide, oh, I've used the wrong term, and go back and change, or at least view, all the places in which you've used that particular term. But look what else happens to um, linearity. This is uh, the result of concordancing. A text has been broken up, and we know how frequently all these various terms are used, and we can get information, example, for example, about the kind of text just on this non-linear analysis. Here's a, a Latin text and because people uh, no longer read Latin very well and because we're going to study the text as one does study Bibles for example, every word has a hyperlink now to some other place where it's used and so we're getting uh, the non-linearity imposed on the text through this technology. Uh, here's what happens. You get the corpus coming back, and you can see how that term is used in all those particular places. But that nonlinearity, of course, is just what we do when we use Google or a search engine. We get to the phrase we're interested in, and we find these various fragments of text which will tell us about how it's used. We want to know what a term means. We can put it in there, see very quickly what kind of context it's used in, what meaning it gets in those positions, and this will tell us about the meaning, but not in, in a horizontal or linear way, it's in a vertical or non-linear way. That's, for example, there. But you see, it's also in the, the electronic communications uh, technologies. Uh, here is Word. In Word, we, we click on the word text, we want to know what it means. Look, you get this vertical range of synonyms, which is telling meaning. Meaning is now no longer in the flow of text, it's in the paradigmatic analysis. And that is what our electronic communications make very easy. The same here in uh, Asistrados. Okay, in a translation memory, 
Your text, the first thing it does, is put the sentences one on top of the other, arranging it in this vertical way and breaking up the linearity. You're no longer going to read that text. In fact, it often becomes hard uh, to read the text in a linear way. Same thing here. I think this is deja vu. Uh, they've, they've all adopted actually that format over time. The text is broken up here. You're going to work on the various fragments of it here, and you get the horizontal fragments over here. You're imposing an entirely paradigmatic or non-linear way of working with text. Okay, and you've got it there again. You can also see this in the way we use websites. This is a heat map, or these are heat maps of various websites. It's uh, based on eye tracking, and it just shows where people look the most uh, when they're receiving a website. I was going to say reading, but people don't really read if that means start at the top left and go to the bottom right. Uh, there are a series of T or F movements where people gather information along the top to see what it's about and sort of skim down the left here to see where this thing's going. But they're not going to read it in a linear way. Uh, we're moving with electronic communications into an age where texts are not produced in a linear way, they're certainly not received in a linear way, and not surprisingly, they're not translated in a linear way. This means that when we get a, a translation job to do, in electronic media at least, we do still get a start text. It might be composed of bits and pieces of fragments or the updates that we have to work on, but there is still something there that we have to use. We can quickly access parallel text to use that paradigmatic, non-sigmatic, non-linear relationship, meaning it comes from that kind of comparison. We have vertical glossaries with definitions, if you're lucky. We're using the spell checkers, as you've seen, that's the vertical relation as well. The translation memories do this, and the machine translation resources that you might want to use are also organized and, in fact, operate in this non-linear vertical way. Our experience of language, our interaction of it, is at the antipodes of what spoken communication was for most of humanity. We have entirely lost that linear experience of text. There you go. The more the text is fixed, the more it can be indexed, and the indexing is like what you get in the Bible. You can go to one piece or the other. Indexing these days is when you read with control. What do you use? Control F for find, control B for buscar. I don't know what it is in German, but you quickly go to that little bit of information you need, and you forget about the rest. Uh, utterances are thus removed from context. So much for all that great discourse of theory where the meaning of an utterance is its function in the context. Uh, our contexts have absolutely been taken away from us by the electronic communications. I want to give you a quick example of the way uh, statistical machine translation is working. Uh, this is what you get these days in uh, Microsoft Translate and Google Translate and all the Moses systems, uh, it's a significant advance on the linguistic analysis of transfer-based machine translation systems. These are example-based or data-based or statistical machine translation systems which are doing something rather spectacular. Here is a translation problem. Nobody knows what Don Quixote had to eat on Saturdays. It's in the first line of the of Don Quixote or Quixote or however you want to call that great novel. And the text in Spanish says that he ate duelos y quebrantos. And if you Google that, you get a picture of duelos y quebrantos, which is sort of lots of greasy chorizo pork in uh, in an in an omelet type thing. Unfortunately, the uh, the dish was invented on the basis of the novel and didn't exist prior to the publication of the novel in uh, 1605. Uh, the dish was invented in the 19th century 
and, and re resuscitated in the 20th century to help uh, tourism based on the novel. Uh, Duales y Cabrantos, if you put it into Google Translate, I don't know if you can see that, can you? Uh, duelos becomes duels, as when two people are fighting, but down the bottom there, you've got other alternative meanings. You see the, the verticality. A duelo can mean mourning, uh, as in when you're grieving for somebody who's dead. Either way, it doesn't sound like something you would want to eat. Uh, let's bit more. Duelos y quebrantos, and we get duels and losses. Oh, doesn't sound good, doesn't sound inviting, but I don't think it's going to work as a translation because it has to be something he could have eaten on Saturdays. Uh, we put in, then, if you put in just one more word, in fact, you could write los sabados on Saturdays, or just los. And duelos y quebrantos los brings up the translation scraps on Saturdays. So the losses and jewels and all that has disappeared, and suddenly you've got a translation we can actually use. It makes some sense in the text. How did that happen? Well, duelos y quebrantos, these are two words that you could find anywhere in the database, and they can only bring up the most common meaning because it's based on statistical analysis of frequency of association. But duelos y quebrantos los, the co-occurrence of those three terms, the E could be left out, uh, is so specific in the language that it's located a previous translation of this text. There are actually quite a few English versions of Don Quixote online and they've been fed into the database. And so we're bringing up not something the machine has translated. The machine didn't analyze this as scraps or anything like that. It's merely located very quickly something that a translator had translated prior to the machine coming along. Uh, people will tell, tell us, um, you know, I can translate much better than the machine can. No machine can translate like a human. What this system is doing is using the machine to locate the correct human translation. What you're getting are human translations. The whole uh, success or failure is in locating the right human working on the right bit of text at the right time. Okay, uh, okay. I, I, it's an example that should illustrate the extreme difference uh, between transfer-based or, or linguistic uh, analytical systems and statistical machine translation, which will give you surprisingly good results sometimes and then surprisingly offbeat crazy results other times which is sometimes an advantage. I mean, it's better to be really wrong, and so a translator can click quickly delete that and then translate from scratch, than just a little bit wrong uh, when the translator has to think, oh, what do I change here? Could this possibly be correct? Uh, and the cognitive process is uh, quite a bit more demanding. This is one reason why I think uh, a future might lie more with machine translation, with post-editing, that is repairing, correcting machine translation, uh, than with translation memories, which give you fuzzy matches, which give you an almost good translation, and you have to think a lot about it. A machine translation gives you something surprisingly good, and then some absolute rubbish, which you can get rid of very quickly. Here's a few other ways in which published translations have rendered uh, duelos y cabrantos. Uh, what Don Quixote was eating. Uh, Eggs and abstinence. This is a recent, very successful translation. Sounds good. Has a, has a, an, a, a certain rhythm to it and appeal. Boiled bones, sorrows and troubles, hash pea soup. I, uh, nobody really knows what he had to eat. We note Smollett's translation, pains and breakings, uh, evidently points at such eatables as generate and expel wind. You have a whole analysis of what was going on in Don Quixote's stomach, uh, which is interesting and very entertaining. Smollett's translation is indeed a very entertaining, but we could just as easily stay with the Google Translate version, Scraps pulled up from a, a translation that I actually haven't been able to locate, but it's somewhere there in that database. 
Now, the promised revolution of uh, statistical machine translation uh, functions this way. Uh, the more people use, um, not just a Google Translate Online, but Google Translate a toolkit, which is a, a set of tools where you do the post-editing, you repair, you fix up the bad translations, and when you fix up those bad translations, the good translation you produce goes into the database. So the database gets better. Okay? And the better it gets, the more people are going to use it. And the more people use it, the better it gets. And the better it gets, the more people use it. You see the thing? And this creates a virtuous circle that leads up to the higher reaches of the Tower of Babel. Technology will get us to the one, not the one perfect language, but uh, machine, universal, usable machine translation. Uh, this is based, of course, on the rapid increase in computer capacity, the memory capacities of computers. Uh, memory capacity, there's a rule saying that it doubles every 18 months. That is, it grows geometrically, not arithmetically. arithmetically. And uh, theorists, uh, particularly Californian theorists, talk about singularity as that moment when the processing capacity of computers will be the same as the human brain. That is, when computers can indeed think as well as we can, if not better. And that moment of singularity is supposed to bring about an entire revolution in the relation between the human brain and the machines we use. Now, I don't know about singularity. Some people say it's going to happen in 2030, 2040. Uh, the date gets moved further away every time you look at them. But uh, at least in the field of translation technology, singularity looked like it would come from this sort of system, but in fact has not arrived and is getting further and further away. Why? Well, because there are so many idiots out in the world who use the Google Translate system or any uh, online free machine translation system, they think, hey, I've got the translation. They publish it, they put it online. Then the Google crawlers come along, pick it up. Oh, I've got a parallel text. Put it in the database and rubbish in, rubbish out. More people bring up things from that database. Uh, it's not good, fewer people use it. And the virtuous circle that was heading up to heaven is now going down to hell. Uh, this is one reason why uh, Google stopped making uh, the machine translation feed uh, that we used to have in the, in the main uh, translation memory system. They stopped making that free. That is, they're getting too much rubbish in the system. The problem is the databases get very dirty. And the future of machine translation uh, seems to be not in having huge databases that are now allow massive uh, statistical uh, work, but in having smaller machine translation systems that are in-house, that is, a particular company has its own machine translation system. It might have a, a particular database for each of its products, It'll write the source text, the source input, in a restricted syntax, so it's easily processed by the machine, and you will get, you do get, a very high quality machine translation outcome that requires quite minimal post-editing. Uh, this, I think, is the future of the machine translation technology. Where we are at the moment with machine translation can be seen here. This is uh, one of my classes, or two of them, uh, doing a post-editing exercise. And you can see half of them do uh, with uh, Google Translate, and the other half work without Google Translate. And then we just compare the time they take. Do they save time? Yes, they do save a little time, but not a great deal of time uh, across all those groups. And the quality is comparable. Uh, that means, I think, that in general we are at a kind of tipping point stage uh, using machine translation or post-editing machine translation uh, does save you a bit of time 
uh, it's therefore more productive and, and, and we should use it and, and experiment with it and improve it. Um, it's more interesting though for us to consider new kinds of errors uh, that result and therefore the new kinds of revision processes that we need. This is from another piece of research by Ignacio Garcia in Sydney. Uh, this, uh, his, his research had a quality control thing and uh, he was comparing Chinese uh, translators using Google Translator Toolkit and uh, not using uh, Google Translator Toolkit. He found that in one test there was a very significant uh, advantage from using machine translation and the other it was not clear. Um, he used professional evaluators and they evaluated the translations very differently, which, uh, which is not very encouraging anyway. But there is uh, a small body of empirical research and there's no doubt that uh, uh, we're at that kind of tipping point where it's becoming... Um, it's at the stage where you've got nothing to lose. You could go along and, and put your text through machine translation and repair that and you might save some time with respect to translating from scratch, you might not. If it's a particularly abstruse subject or you're working with Japanese or Korean, it probably won't help you very much. Uh, but you've got not much to lose for the other languages. This is what I was saying, I think, about the use of MT. Uh, in-house empty systems and what it really means is that machine translation becomes like a big translation memory TM. For all that though, for all that, there is still linearity. Just wanted to show you, I might have showed you this before, anyway. Uh, this is a person translating a text. It's a man. He's very linear when he works through the text. There are jumps backwards and forwards, of course, because translation is not a strictly linear process. It requires reconstructing cohesion, etc., and it's a very complex process. Compare this, though, with the way a woman translated the same text. Just as complex here, but look, the woman looked at the woman, needed the image, needed to construct a voice, somehow was thinking about that person Amy Winehouse, as a person who said this text. Uh, the technologies are forcing us to an objectification of the text, where it's a set of things and a set of abstract problems we have to solve. There is, though, this possibility, this personification process, whereby people can still see the text as the voice of a person with its particular linearity. The technology doesn't favour that, but it still exists. And that is what I think is in a situation of some peril. I want to think about this now from the perspective of what's called the philosophy of dialogue. And I draw on the work of a Finnish scholar who was working in Finland, Arno Legg. And uh, Arnold Leg picks up this particularly French or German-French uh, philosophical tradition uh, concerning the dignity and difference of the other, uh, where um, the ethical relation to a text is to treat it as a second person, a du, a thou in English, du of Deutsch, and not as a thing, as a third person, s. Okay. Uh, this actually comes from Martin Buber, which I can give you in German. Uh, it, it's, a, it's a fascinating text, and it begins this way. It's Ich und Du, I think. Yes. Uh, there are two relations between hum the human and the world, uh, and there are two basic words. Okay, And the basic words are not isolated words, but pairs of words. One basic word is Ich, Du, I, Thou. The other basic word is I, it, ich, es. Okay. There is a relationship with an intimate other, a human like us, and a second kind of relationship between the human, the first person, and the thing. Uh, both exist. Both exist in our world. 
uh, but the relation with the person is subject to ethical constraints and considerations in a way that the relation with things are not. Uh, do you speak to your children or your parents or your siblings in the same way as you swear at your car? If it goes wrong or something. Okay. Now, uh, Legge's uh, proposition is that uh, ethical translation uh, asks when you're stuck, uh, what do you mean? That's the voice behind the text, the person there, rather than what does this mean, this thing there, this linguistic object, this linguistic problem. If you ask what you mean, you will get a kind of answer from your capacity to use empathy or to put yourself in the hypothetical position of the other or to show respect uh, for that other. Uh, if you're asking about the thing, you will have to use your linguistic rules or what you've learned from various technologies or indeed your online technologies. There's a very serious conflict then between the kind of translating that operates on the level of voice, personification, a second person, and the other kind of translation, which is working with a world of things. There seems very little doubt that in the age of electronic communication, the relation with things is gaining ground of, over the relation with persons. Uh, that, though, is not a fatality. I also note that the age of electronic communication is now very audio-visual, that we have talking heads and linearity on YouTube and places like that, so there is no definitive tendency as yet. In general, though, the history of technology um, tells us that there is no longer any immediate presence or even supposition of presence as there was ideally and in a very idealized way in pre-written communication. Uh, between ourselves and the other we have language which is no longer immediately checked by uh, a dialogue or conversation process. Uh, it means that not only is language a source of problems but also the writing system that is used to uh, represent language And the distance, the historical distance, as well as the geographical distance between text production and text translation, and then text usage. You can go on there as well. Reviewing is another process that is done further away from authorship or text production, even though it's supposed to bring the text closer to where it should be. So there is no logic of return to any true sense in the original context. We have to accept these days, in most of our texts, most of our jobs, the other is normally absent. Even though we can reconstruct that image of the other, just as we could do with the image of Amy Winehouse, that helps us understand her interview. The actual other that we have present is the client, not the author, and not really the end user. So, Scopo's theory in his day, I think, responded to these technologies by uh, introducing a, a principle of realism. You know, the person you're really talking with, if anybody, the person you have closest to your job is the client. And let's consider that relation rather than the previous relation with the author belonging to the age of print or the end user, which is what people do talk about these days because we're translating instruction manuals. And we think there are people out there using our websites or our YouTube videos. One of the problems uh, with the technology and indeed with Scopos theory is that it, it assumed that the translator was an individual and had the sovereignty, that is, had the power, the decision-making capacity to decide about the Scopos and to speak with the client uh, as a first to second person uh, relation in a, a position of dialogue. The sad reality is that our translators tend to work in teams, in technical teams. Uh, they tend to be distant from the location of the client and often not told anything about the purpose of the translation. And their work is becoming uh, problem solving on technical pieces of language. That is, uh, the theory is wonderful, deciding how an individual should make these decisions. 
The sad reality, though, is that uh, we are no longer individuals working on a text. That was the case of print. That was the case of Etienne Dolé. Uh, we have returned to that medieval teamwork type approach to language. Also, that medieval variability of language, uh, which uh, enables a, a new kind of creation not based on personal responsibility. And perhaps the ethic of dialogue, that philosophy of dialogue is becoming limited in its applicability. I might have shown you this before, but I'll run through it again just in case. This is a model of how a translation process might operate with the technologies we have available, with the electronic technologies. A text comes in, it's segmented. First thing, it's broken up one on top of the other. It becomes hierarchical. Uh, it goes through a translation memory from a glossary and then uh, goes through a machine translation system. Uh, that's going to produce something pretty rough and that goes out to the crowd, to people who are not being paid to do this, they're interested in it. It might be the company or, or people who, who work in the field. This might be Greenpeace, it might be people who know about ecology or particular parts of the world and uh, uh, they can uh, usually correct all the terminology because they know it in, in the target language. Uh, but then that goes to professional translators who clean it up and check it and probably put in the syntax, uh, which is going to be more difficult for the people here. These people don't know the source language. These people here do and can make uh, those corresponding kinds of corrections to the text. It then goes to a style uh, correction. There's a review. We check it's all there. We put it back into its format with the images, which will have been lost along the way, for example, and then its localized concept uh, content, uh, which is published. Where is the work of translators happening here? Well, not just translating, because the machine does a first translation not providing the terminology or making sure it sounds right in the target language for the users, because these people have their word to say as well. They're coming in and doing that bit. Our work becomes cleaning it up, checking it, making that sure that it's a, a, a valid translation, fixing out syntax especially, and then authorizing it, putting a stamp of approval, saying, yes, this, this is good to go. Uh, and those kinds of relationships or, or, or activities are what our jobs could look like in future. Come what may, we will certainly be working with technologies and with people with other expertise. I think we should these days question some of the myths that are circulating about technology. People say the machine cannot translate like a human. Well, the machines are locating human translations. Uh, progress with machine translation is inevitable. Uh, no, we have writ witnessed in the past 10 years uh, something that seemed like an inevitable process uh, go wrong. And machine translation, uh, you know, universal high uh, database or high, high content uh, machine translation has not become what it was promised to be, although it, you know, it, it improves all the time, things are getting better. Does machine translation take work away from professionals? No. Uh, there is so much more content to be translated uh, that uh, professionals are not uh, struggling to find work, we're struggling to keep up with the demands, and machine translation definitely helps us in this rather than hinders us. If um, translators are becoming post-editors of machine translation, that is problematic for some expectations. I've had students, when I ask them to do a post-editing exercise, say, no, I'm here to learn about translation, not post-editing, I'm not going to do it. And I tell them, fine, don't do it, don't go away, you know, that's, that's fine, I don't care. Uh, but you might find that you can go quicker, save money and make a bit more. Uh, save money and, and make a bit more money uh, by working with machines. Machine translation will replace human translation. Probably in many situations where accuracy and authority is not required, 
but there are still many, many situations where high-risk communication does require our intervention and our human authority, our status, our professional status, if you like. And the final myth that I would question is that human translating will always be what it always was. No. You look at the history, it was very different in the age of the voice, very different in the age of parchment, very different with paper, very different with print. Of course, it's going to be very different in the age of electronic communication. There should be no myth or surprise about that. A uh, final word. Uh, people say, oh, these technologies with their imperfections, and they are imperfect technologies, they are bringing us all down. They are reducing the value of the high-quality human translation. And it's true. I think the high-quality human translation is becoming a luxury item. It is expensive, and people can get it much cheaper. However, it's still required in many circumstances, often for symbolic virtue. I remember recently there was a meeting uh, concerning uh, Iran's agreement to have inspections or not of its uh, nuclear development program. And at the end of the meeting, uh, there was an English text presented to the, to, to, to the press and the Iranian representative said, well, now I'm going to say exactly the same thing in Farsi. Uh, don't bother about this, the press. I'm going to say it in uh, exactly the same thing. Now, as translators, we know it's not exactly the same thing. It can't be exactly the same thing. But symbolically, it had to be exactly the same thing. Why should he say it in Farsi? If the negotiations had been carried out in English, the information had been given in English to all the press there who had taken down their notes in English. Well, the Farsi was there for Persian television, of course, but also to show symbolic equality between the cultures and the neg negotiating parties. There is no equality in the transnational flows of information between languages. There is no equality in the distribution of technologies or the capacity to use the technologies. But there is a role for that symbolic equality, that absolute respect for the other. In fact, the establishment of a first, second person, human relationship, and that kind of quality and that kind of symbolic justification does require our intervention, our authority, our expertise, and our status.